Linda. The stream has started. You know, it says 960 to 600 resolution. Is that okay? Yeah, don't worry about all that. Just ignore all that. about three minutes okay so I'll do the uh Quickly run through some of the past talks. Yeah. And then hand over to Ashwin and then we can introduce uh, Ranay. And, and Like an exam. Mm -hmm. yeah. Un unknow <laughs> unknowing way, <rate, huh>? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I try to. That's why I try to. When we do it live from the TVA, I try to wait until the actual program starts and before you know, asking them to get for a fee. Otherwise, you have five minutes of dead air, you're just looking at each other. Blank screen. We'll get the uh, very precision stuff afterwards. We'll put like a loop video or something while we are pausing. This is just our second, uh, second or third uh, uh, live webcast from kind of session. Before that, we'll doing from. So when you put it on YouTube, is it going to get edited or is it going to be? When we put it on the. Going live on YouTube, but the, the final version that will be yeah yeah on YouTube. yeah. If if there are things to be removed, we can do that. Okay. So shall we start for a while? Just give me one second. The intro is kind of to get people. Uh, it's also get people time to you know the five minute pause while they log in and watch. So I'll go ahead and start. I'm going to share my PowerPoint and just quickly run through the... Yeah, yeah. Good evening, folks. Uh, welcome to uh, the June version of the Varah Meera Science Forum Lectures. Uh, we are very thankful to Pranay Dal author of Indica for agreeing to give a speech today. We are thankful also for Ashwin to help, uh, 
helping us uh, get on along with this project i'm going to give a brief introduction of uh, varaha meera science forum then hand it over to ashwin and ashwin will introduce the speaker and then we'll have the speaker give his talk at the end of which you can ask questions in the youtube channel and then badri will post them to the speaker and he will answer them on the air so we started this forum uh, Nearly three years back, August 20 was the first uh, lecture. We kind of started it off as an experimental effort. We wanted to have a series of lectures for science le lectures on science targeted at the general public. Those of you who have attended this program before have heard this from me several times. So for those of you who are new, uh, that's that's who this this is at. Um, so. our basic idea is to invite speakers both professional and amateurs professional for their deep knowledge of the subject amateurs so that they can uh, uh, tell us in a way that you know they understood it also because sometimes professionals talk to other people in the profession rather than the general public we have uh, in madras before and even now uh, programs of lectures targeted uh, at experts those generally tend to happen in you know restricted institutions so the engineering lectures will be in an engineering college or an iit or something a lecture on medicine or biology may happen at a medical college or the hospital the general public may not be able to access this so we wanted a forum where uh, general public can attend these programs some of the lectures are also targeted you know to not to be too sophisticated not too cutting edge but give a general idea of the field so several Uh, topics. Uh, I started off uh, with my lecture in August 2017 about Antoine Lavoisier, the French chemist, and how modern chemistry really starts with him. Um, then we had uh, Badri uh, speak about uh, a couple of interesting discoveries and a Madras discovery: the triple helix, the single helix, the double helix, the triple helix uh, structures of protein DNA and uh, and the collagen. Uh, so that was a, a lecture on biology with a little bit of uh, geometry then we had shivaraman speak about uh, you know microbiology bacteriophages something that we are not very familiar with but uh, considered a major breakthrough long time back uh, siddharth spoke about isaac newton on his principia mathematica uh, so i am just going to run through all of these instead of talking about each other i'm going to run through all of these books and topics Uh, we had uh, Professor Mr. Swami Aladi talk about his father's theoretical science seminar and how the Math Science Institute was created in Madras. And there was a bunch of lectures long before Vara Meera Science Forum. We had people like uh, you know Niels Bohr come and visit Madras and give lectures. So um, we are proud to carry on this tradition. Uh, physicist, one of our friends, a very young, one of the youngest speakers, Akash Narayanan, now doing research in University of Illinois, gave a talk talk about atomic theory, which is what he is working in. And he said uh, to make it a kind of a generic thing, atomic theory for Alamelu party, and right there you can see Planck and Einstein and all those guys. And we had a, we actually had an earlier geology lecture by Dr. Singhanandan, who is the director of the Geological Survey in Madras. This topic was uh, wandering rivers and cruising coast coastlines, specifically about the geology of Madras. As you can see in the photo, Robert Foote there, and then some of the maps of. Um, a kind of a more generic talk. Venkatesh Ramakrishnan talked about uh, uh, how technology came to Madras: the phone, the aeroplane, uh, water management, electric trains, gramophone records, all things that we think of. Thing, you know, even the even the idli grinder. Uh, how all of these you know appeared historically. Uh, so you can get a sense from the Narasaya, uh, who was uh, an author, a historian, uh, worked in the Indian Navy, then worked for the Indian Merchant Marines. Uh, served as the uh, you know as the deck engineer on the INS Vikrant India's first uh, aircraft carrier he talked about uh, his uh, career in the navy and about ships and his experiences in the bangladesh war and so on uh, we, uh, we had uh, shashwat who is really uh, into software testing he spoke about the indian monsoon and how the geography of india is uh, you know changes how the monsoon travels around uh, sir about on the kola alam and uh, medieval 15th century uh, mathematics book in tamil by dr sita sundar ram uh, of the sanskrit college uh, we had a lecture by uh, dr dayanandan of the madras christian college he talked about evolution and its grand heritage and you know the history all the way from well before darwin up to the current uh, situation so 
some of the discoveries and so on. Uh, I gave a lecture in Tamil. Our first year was entirely in English. So I gave a lecture in Tamil about the astronomy of uh, various ancient cultures, the Mayans, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, Chinese, etc. Antai Nagari, Mani, Mani, that was astronomy and the mathematics of ancient cultures. Uh, we had a talk by Dr. Arvind Gupta. This was really, really popular. We had, you know, 50 people on the stage besides the full house. And marvelous uh, uh, lecture on the science of toys. Incidentally, all of these lectures are on our YouTube channel, Varahamira Science Forum. Just go to YouTube, search for Varahamira Live. You are seeing this uh, program also. And you can see recordings of the previous programs. We had a lecture by Kannan Rajendran on the construction of the Periyar Dam by Penicuit in the 1920s. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Uttara Dare Rajan talk about Lilavati's daughters, about the women scientists of India, about 100, 150 years we had that footage. Uh, all kinds of contributions were so some of the people were really forgotten by even uh, you know, very significant contributions made by very interesting scientists. Um, we had uh, Dr. Nilu Ramchandran, University of California, San Diego, the author of uh, Phantoms in the Brain, the world famous neurologist. He talked about the heuristics of scientific discovery. And then he gave a surprise bonus lecture, the relevance of Freud in modern neuroscience. We had Badri again speak about the structure of the ribosome. Venki Ramakrishnan's uh, Nobel Prize winning work from a few, couple of years, few years back. Uh, we, had, uh, we had a research scholar from the uh, uh, Leibniz University, um, uh, Satish Kumar Saravanan, talk about gravity, a brief history of gravity. Um, we had weather and climate in Sangam poetry, references to weather patterns and other things by a meteorologist, Dr. K.V. Balasu, in the name of the Regional Med Center from Madras. Uh, we had a lecture on the architecture of God's schemes and models by architect Ramon Ayeran, on CRISPR, a gene editing tool by Ramanan, uh, who also gave last month, uh, last, the previous month's lecture, and uh, a history of neuroscience uh, by Nishan Chandrasekhar, a very, very fresh graduate, the brother of uh, Siddharth, who spoke earlier about Newton. We had Akash again, who talked about Alamelu party and uh, Atomic theory talked about the story of light, including Newton's prisms experiment and all kinds of uh, you know, uh, Maxwell's uh, equations and so on. We had another lecture in Tamil by Dr. Arun Kumar, a nutrition biologist, uh, uh, biologist, agriculture biologist, who talked about uh, nutrition in your food, nutrients in your food. Uh, we had a talk about uh, physicist Gilbert Lewis, uh, one of the giants of 20th century chemistry. And uh, we had a talk with Siddharth Chandrasekhar who earlier spoken about uh, uh, Newton's principia about this. Um, then we followed up this uh, with uh, a bunch of uh, lectures by kids, school kids. Uh, inspired uh, some of the kids, you know, one or two of the kids were from the stage from Arvind Gupta's talk, one or two from the uh, summer camp that we did a couple of years back. We had four kids talk about various different science experiments that they did. A couple of them went out and, you know, one of them got won an award, went to Singapore, presented there and all that. They had already done that before they came on to our program. Uh, so that was very nice. We had uh, kids presenting. That hall was full too. There was a bunch of kids from different schools came up and spoke to the program. So we kind of hope to make that an annual feature too. We'd like to not just have the adults do it every year. Perhaps kids do it each year. This is when we reveal the Arahamira Science Forum logo. Uh, there is an Indus connection and then there is a Alanda connection and the Pandya uh, Steppel connection, which, which I skipped. You can go see it in one of the videos. We had Dr. Srinivas Rao of Mad Science talk about the life and works of C.B. Raman. Uh, we are running a course, by the way, right now. We have done three batches of Indian mathematics astronomy. We start one tomorrow. I'll be teaching it online. People have already registered for it. If you're interested, ask us, and then we can, we can try to join the next batch. And this is the one that we are starting tomorrow. Uh, we had uh, another set of school students from a local school do a bunch of experiments with the sundial. Uh, Professor Swaminathan, one of our founders, uh, kind of set it up and explained it to their teachers, and they are teaching it to their kids. Uh, then uh, we had Dr. Ramchandran again came and speak about the art of scientific discovery last December. Uh, just like to add a note, promo note, and perhaps an appreciation note. Ramachandran has read Pranay Lal Sindhika and had good words, or good words about it. So Pranay. Um, and uh, we had, uh, we are supposed to have this talk, but really Corona kind of interfered, so we kind of, uh, this talk got postponed, the one about infectious disease got postponed. What we had next month instead is uh, something related to that. Ramanan Jagannathan spoke about viruses and inflammation. 
uh, we have a kutaka workshop that Badri is doing al Aribata's algorithms. We'll start that again. A lot of response to that, a lot of interest in that. That is entirely online. We'll do one more online workshop. And then last month we had uh, Professor Ram Ravindran of IIT Madras give a talk about what is artificial intelligence. Very interesting picture. And finally we have today uh, Ranai Lal about the talk as well. Ashwin, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Gopu. Badri, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, go on. All right. So, thank you. Thank you, Gopu, for taking us uh, through that rich uh, three year history of uh, the Varahamihira Science Forum lecture. Uh, and I'm delighted to be able to, to introduce uh, Pranay Lal and uh, have him uh, be included in that long list of excellent lectures he spoke of. Um, and um, it's been an absolute pleasure knowing Pranay for the last couple of years. And incidentally, I met him uh, here in Chennai, I, I think just around two years back. And uh, a journalist friend of mine um, wanted to do a podcast with Pranay on his um, book, which was, which was fairly new then, Indica. And uh, I tagged along to try and help out with that podcast episode. And I distinctly remember meeting Pranay in the lobby of the city hotel and having an absolutely delightful conversation running into a couple of hours. And I think what came through clearly in that conversation was his um, absolute love um, for the natural landscapes um, of the country and the history of those landscapes. Um, and uh, he's going to allude to that. And in fact, our desert is going to take center position in his um, talk today. Uh, but uh, many of you may already know that he's also a biochemist by training. So really, when Gopu and I were, were thinking about what we would like Pranay to talk, uh, it was actually a toss-up between whether he would talk about viruses or he would talk about the natural landscape of, uh, of India. Uh, and then we said that uh, perhaps uh, there's been a lot said this season on the virus, and speaking about India's natural history would be like a breath of fresh air. So we spoke to Pranay, and um, he threw a, a whole set of topics at us. Um, uh, he asked us if he would um, uh, if he would want him to speak about Indica again, um, or uh, maybe a typical field trip of his. So he has this unique um, style of going out into the uh, going out into the hinterland, the natural hinterland of the country, and then discovering something absolutely fascinating and unearthing uh, a nugget of information which uh, which very few of us would have heard before. Um, so one of the other candidates for the lecture today was uh, how he goes about constructing a typical field trip of this. Uh, but then when he told us that he could also speak about uh, about the Thar Desert, I think we went for it. We picked that instantly, and uh, Pranay was happy to go along with that. Um, speaking about Pranay himself, um, he's some kind of a Renaissance man, uh, actually. He's a biochemist by training, like I said. Uh, he also holds a full-time job with a non-profit organization uh, working in the larger space of public health. So he's, he's, he's quite busy and he's clocking, uh, I don't know, 18-hour work days, I think, for the last three months. Uh, and I'm um, deeply uh, grateful to Pranay for us being through this lecture for us at short notice. I mean, he's had a, a torrid few months uh, working with, uh, with the pandemic and its, uh, and its spread in the national capital region. So thank you, Pranay, for doing this. Uh, but like I said, he's a man of many talents, uh, very, very versatile indeed. I didn't know this, but um, uh, he's also been a caricaturist for a news publication, an animator for an ad agency, and an environmental campaigner to boot. Um, uh, so that tells us a little about, uh, about his many talents, his many interests, and how he manages to go both broad and deep into all of these. About the book, Indica, A Deep Natural History of Indian Subcontinent, I'm sure many of you uh, now uh, logged on to this lecture have already read it, uh, but it has consistently stayed at the top or uh, near the top of the reading list of most book lovers, I think, for the last three or four years now, ever since it's been out on the bookshelf. Uh, and I think uh, uh, testimony to that has been the many, many prizes um, that, this, um, that this literary work has won, be it the nonfiction debut award at the Tata List Festival in 2017, the Best Book Award at the World Book Fair 2017, or the fact that Indica made it to the top 10 memorable books of the year by Amazon and the Hindu nonfiction book. So it's, the list runs long. Um, and I think for those of us who have read the book, uh, there's no surprise in that at all. Um, but um, um, coming back to today's talk, the Thar Desert, 
uh, I think there are several intriguing facts which um, which, which Pranay has has promised to regale us with interesting stories which he says have never been told. Uh, so knowing how good a raconteur Pranay uh, Prana is, uh, I can I can hardly wait, and I'm sure so so are you. Uh, so let's get started then, uh, Pranay. Over to you. Thank you so much again um, for agreeing to do this. Uh, and I and I would like to believe that uh, Chennai is very close to your heart and. Um, your association with the city and uh, the city's book lovers continue. So thank you very much for doing this, and uh, we're all looking forward to hearing your talk. Yeah, uh, uh, Pranay, just before you can start, um, if you could just uh, give a slightly louder uh, presentation, because audio, there seems to be some issue. So okay. think of a large audience, and if you could shout, if you could please. Um, you know, raise your voice level, that would be fine. Because both uh, people are saying that my voice is quite loud, uh, but Gopu and Ashwin, they have uh, problems following. Um, so, uh, to the best that you this can. This is good, Padri. This is good. Uh, this I, is can, good. I can hear you clearly, uh, but I have no idea how it's uh, happening in the uh, YouTube. Uh, but uh, please I continue. We could hear each other well, so I think I'll let me start, and in case people can send. Uh, yeah, I, I will give you signals. Much. Yeah. Okay. okay. So thank you, Ashwin, for the very generous introduction. Uh, you're always very kind to me. Uh, thank you, Gopu, for having me in such a illustrious space. I'm, I'm, I'm I wish I could have uh, made this uh, talk at a time when we were in better times. I think uh, we are living in straits times. And thank you, Badri, for coordinating and getting me around this laptop and you know, solving all our problems. Um, from our com comforts of our home, um, I'm going to take you to a journey which is both uh, deep in sense of time, also in terms of distance. I'm going to take you to a journey uh, in a sense that this is it's going to be a bit of a roller coaster. I'm going to move, shift time as if, uh, you know, talking about millions and billions of years as if uh, nothing has happened. But trust me, those those years in geological time and in terms of weather are significant. Um, let me start by uh, with my presentation. And uh, let me uh, tell you that as we speak, the Thar Desert is completely, uh, at least in terms of human uh, condition, an extremely torrid place to be in. I mean, today at Churu, the temperature was 47.2 degrees. It's really, really hot. Uh, some rural roads, which are still made out of char, would be melted. If you were to walk bare feet or in your rubber chappers, your chappers or your feet might get stuck. And it's quite painful. I know that feeling. I grew up in the Sahara Desert. So it's really, really not a very pleasant place to be in just now. But Thar is, uh, is, an, is an extremely uh, interesting place to be in. And I'm going to take you to uh, a very, very short journey in the sense of time. But this is, a, in, in a sense, a very zipped uh, version of what amazing... Um, Splendors and, and, and wondrous gems it holds within us. For those of you who don't know uh, me, this is the book I wrote in 2016. It came out in December 2016, and it's been a, a long uh, journey since then. I've been, uh, you know, I've had been, I've been showered by a lot, lot of uh, uh, love and uh, you know, a lot of felicitation and commendations by several people, just as Ashwin mentioned. But you know, the real motive of writing this book was to get a stronger appreciation for the geological and the natural history uh, that we have uh, within India and the Indian subcontinent. So today I'm going to just speak, speak to you about why does the Thar Desert exist and, and what is what the real conundrum is that it is a desert that exists between two very large river systems, you know, the Indo-Gangetic uh, Basin and the Indus Basin. So why is it that you have right in the center of that a uh, pretty prominent desert? So that's one thing that has intrigued me as a child. And the second thing that I'm going to take take you to you is uh, my very typical journey that I undertake whenever I travel by road. Uh, I like to look at rocks and rivers and road cuts and uh, tunnels. And you know those are the kind of things I look for because the rocks by themselves are so beautiful and they tell you an immense story that uh, both in terms of uh, the riches that they hold in terms of fossils and minerals and, uh, and other data that I love to interpret. I'm going to take you first 55 million years ago. Uh, this is a map of uh, the world of how it would have looked 55 million years ago. 
this is the time when the dinosaurs had just died and the flowering trees had taken over. The coniferous forests were retreating. They were now localized. The grasslands were expanding. But what was very fascinating at this time... Uh, one second. Uh, the, Pranay, uh, uh, can you share your screen? Uh, the presentation oh, is it not happening? Yeah. Sorry. Can you just... Uh, sorry. Uh, what, what, what have I not done? Oh, oh I'm not on sharing screen. Yeah. Ah, yeah, you. Okay. Uh, here we are. And also, you, you, do you have a, a microphone which is close enough to your uh, I'm going to face? speak closer to the, uh, to the laptop. Is this better? Yeah. Uh, normally, if you if you're wearing a speaker come uh, microphone, it will pick right. up much better. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't have one yet. Okay. I think I'll speak like sure. This. Please. Yeah. Uh, okay. And if yeah, you could... Go ahead like this. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I just go back to my previous slide. Uh, I'm sorry. I made a... Uh, That's okay. Uh, That's okay. Yeah. So... So, like I said, my presentation today is going to be talk of, talking about why does the Thar Desert exist, especially when it is ensconced between uh, two large river systems, that is the Indo-Gangetic uh, rivers and the Indus rivers. And the second thing that I would do in a very uh, binzip manner is to look at uh, how do I typically undertake a journey and what is it that I find so fascinating in, uh, in a desert. So I'm going to take you first back in time this is 55 million years ago, uh, you know, uh, about 30 million years earlier, Madagascar had split uh, from India. And this is the time when India was being pushed uh, uh, because of seafloor spreading between Madagascar and uh, the western margin of India. This, the land below that was uh, in the sea was spreading and that was pushing India northwards. So this is the time when India was about to collide with uh, Tibet, you could see the, the brown uh, uh, layers that, is, that lie just north of where Nepal is today. If you look at that sliver of brown, that is the one that Tibet uh, was at that time. Now, if you notice uh, on the eastern side of the map, uh, you know, where Shanghai would be today, and if you were to take this right along, uh, you know, the margin, uh, crossing North India, going across Arabia, you would go right through the Mediterranean Sea and go as far as Barcelona. And that is the thin sliver of sea that is cutting across the latitude, which created something called the Tethys Sea. This is a, a remarkable place in terms of all the mammalian innovations that would, were to happen. This is the place where the whales evolved. This is also the place where the giant land mammals were evolving. So it is a very interesting time in terms of evolution of mammals and the modern forest. I'm going to come now to 21,000 years ago. All the, all the land masses have come to rest. The world looks very similar to what it is today. The only thing to notice here is that if you look at where Indonesia is today or Australia on the eastern uh, side, the east, uh, sorry, the, the right hand side of the image just now, if you were to look at this, you would notice that the margins of Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines, and also the northern part of Australia is still not carved out. Now that's because a lot of ice had started to pack, both in the Antarctica and Arctic. I'm just going to go back to the previous uh, image. Please notice that this, in this image, you would see that there's no North Pole yet. There's no ice, and the South Pole, the Antarctica region is a forest by itself. It is no different from Africa or Asia or India. And let's imagine coming back to 20, uh, 21,000 years ago, this is the last massive glacial event that the Earth would see. There would be other smaller glacial events. Uh, we will talk about them a little later because they are critical to the way they shape uh, the modern uh, deserts and the grasslands. But for the moment, just look at this particular image you notice that there is a huge amount of ice covering as south as, you know, middle of Atlanta, the city. If you were to look at uh, the map of America just now, you would see that London or uh, all of uh, the, the UK is actually under ice. And you notice that uh, all of uh, Berlin and Paris and, and Moscow and Tokyo and Shanghai are all also under, under a thick layer of and this is the time when you start seeing the earth because all the water that is circulating has now got locked into these holes. 
And you notice that if you look at again on the western margin of America, you see the rise of the not just the Rockies, but alongside the Rockies, you see on, on parallel to them uh, the Sonoran Desert and the Great California Desert. You see a thin sliver along the Andes. The Andes are only just forming. I mean, they, they are very young mountains. And there is a sliver of, uh, the, of the desert there, the Atacama Desert. The Sahara, as you notice, is still not formed. There's a small patch of a brown, uh, you know, in the center. It's like a star-shaped uh, center, which had a bit of a dry grassland kind of a semi-arid space. But it is certainly not a desert. Really. There is a there is a thin desert that lines along the Red Sea, which is on the Arabian side, and there's a large desert going from the, uh, the, the lake uh, region of uh, eastern Africa to as far, as far down as uh, uh, the Kalahari and the Namib, Namib Desert. So there's a massive desert there. Again, look at the Great Australian Desert is yet to form. There is a small desert which is closer to Iran and Afghanistan, and that's about it. There's a cold desert north of Tibet, and there is no other desert to look from if you were to see from space. Now, what I'm going to come to is that the remember when I spoke to you about the Tethys Flow, the great sea that connected that stretch from Shanghai to Spain. When that was open, the ocean currents were still forming, and most of these spaces were still islands. And these islands were fed by short bursts of monsoons. They were not large monsoons like like the ones that exist today there were perhaps two or three monsoons but they were it was largely a tropical environment all over the world now this is this image on the left that you see is called the open tethys model and this is in and 48 million years ago now when the tethys closed you start noticing that the deserts began to begin to expand and you notice for a short while that the oldest desert, at least in the northern hemisphere, is, uh, is the Arabian Desert. And this is where uh, now, we now know is that the expansion of the desert begins from different nodes across the northern hemisphere. I'm going to show you this image because this is perhaps the earliest image of uh, which was uh, reconstituted after Apollo 1's mission, the first space mission photograph that came back. Uh, so uh, I'm going to now, uh, you know, remind you something that we did in, uh, you know, our geography lessons in class eight or nine, studying the ocean currents. I know this is, uh, this might look very trite to you, but there is something very hidden here. This is something that we were not told when we were studying ocean currents. One of the drivers of the creation of deserts, the underlying uh, force that decides where uh, deserts are going to get located are defined by two things, ocean currents and the tropical air spells, which are called the Hadley currents. Now, the Hadley currents go uh, in anti-clockwise direction in the northern hemisphere and in the clockwise direction in the southern hemisphere. And what this does is that it desiccates the parts of the place where they take the moisture from and move it away from the source, from where these ocean currents are bringing the moisture. So if you were to notice where the currents are moving away from, the ocean currents, uh, look at the western margin of uh, America, for example. You get the California currents, which is on to your extreme left, which is a cold current. And it takes away most of the moisture that you see that, uh, that California or uh, northern part of Mexico is supposed to get, but it just does not get dropped. It just gets carried away and gets taken by the Hadley cells towards the equator. The same thing happens if you were to go down that map and if you were to look at the other Gaia that is below. There are two currents that snatch away the moisture that, that come to South America. Let's come to India because this is where we are interested. Now, now as you know, the Indian Ocean is the only ocean that, is not con that does not connect the Arctic to the Antarctic. As a result, our ocean current currents are complex and they are also not very powerful. But in terms of air supply and air circulation, the Asian monsoon is possibly the most powerful. That's because of the heat that the, that the Asian subcontinent and the South Asian subcontinent tends to amass during summer. 
Now, they are, there is a Bengal Gaya that you notice, which is on the, that circular pattern that you see in the Bay of Bengal, which is a minor current. But there is a larger current which comes from Australia. And there's another current called the uh, Aguela current, which uh, comes from uh, south of Madagascar going towards South Africa. Now, both these currents are the ones that bear moisture and carry it towards north of the equator and ensure that, that the moisture that is coming from Antarctica come as far as the, the south tip of India. And this is where the buildup of the ancient mon Asian monsoons begin. I'm going to show you this beautiful illustration. Uh, this is an, you, the western margin of Sahara, and you can see a normal dust storm that is happening. This happens about uh, three or four times every year in the summer months from uh, North Africa. It's a very small uh, uh, you know, event that happens, but it is persistent and it happens on a regular basis. Something that we don't appreciate about deserts is the fertilization of the of nutrients that it does for the rainforest. So if you were to connect all the rainforests of the world, the deserts are the ones that are providing all the nutrients to the uh, tropical soils. Tropical soils that themselves are quite uh, famished for nutrients. The, the phosphorus and the free iron that, uh, that you get from the desert uh, sands are actually carried by these gusts of wind. Now let me take you to the other side. If you were to look at uh, the, uh, you know, uh, across the Gulf of Oman and look at the Saudi Arabia, uh, the Arabian desert, you'd notice that there would be a gust of wind that comes on a constant basis and this fertilization comes right across to uh, uh, to the Western Ghats and to the Central Indian uh, Peninsula. What this means is that there is additional nutrient. It's not. Don't look at it only in the form of dust or dust storms. This is an important point. is an important integral part of fertilization and enrichment of soils. And this is. Uh, Something that has happened, uh, you know, this is how I mean, you, you imagine the, uh, the, the Indian, uh, the Great Indian Desert. Now, notice that you have inundations of uh, salt pans coming from Gujarat because of depression. You also notice that there is a wide delta of the Indus, which is on the, which marks the western margin of the uh, Indian Desert. What is critical and very different about the Indian Desert is that it, although there are barriers, small barriers that uh, induce some control on the monsoon, there is also a tectonic force that is creating and shaping the flow of the river and the ingress of the sea. So there have been massive earthquakes that have happened, which have shifted the course of the Indus and moved it away, moved it westwards. And what, what has also happened is that the, the, the gulfs and the bays in, within the uh, Indian Gujarat have also got shaped because of tectonic shift that is taking place deep under the sea in in, uh, in the Indian Ocean. Now, so all those tectonic forces are also making sure that the rivers are getting reoriented very regularly and the shape of the desert by itself is not constant. This is a very simplistic diagram from, uh, I've taken it from uh, uh, Professor Vadhavan's uh, book. Uh, this basically shows you that you know the two drainage systems that you have uh, for the rivers, uh, the Indo-Gangetic rivers and the Indus rivers. And you can see that there are enough liniments. Now, liniments are basically uh, fault lines that exist in tectonic plates, which make sure that the earth underneath uh, the desert or the soils is still uh, active and is mobile. And you know any shifts would create either depression or create new courses for rivers or create hills. And over millions and maybe billions of years, this geography is going to transform significantly. So just to summarize what I've just said, uh, you know, if you were to look at any desert today, there are deserts that have uh, deep continental settings. That means because of isolation, because rain-bearing clouds are not able to reach that far within. Uh, a continental setting, uh, they remain dry and therefore become deserts. An example of this is the Mongolian. 
The other is the desiccating effect of the cold currents, something that I just talked talk to you about. You know, the lack of uh, the currents depositing enough moisture on the margins of the uh, of the, the uh, of land, and that causes uh, moisture rather than being deposited, getting sucked out. Uh, the third thing uh, that can happen that can initiate uh, aridity is a steep rain shadow area. That means you have a high continental transverse mountains that is going north from north to south, like the Andes or the Western Ghats, for that matter, or, or even the Alps. Now, if you would be very surprised that Spain has a small desert and Hungary has a small desert. That's because of the creation of Alps. Um, there are two, therefore, other factors that determine it. Of course, the subtropical sec uh, setting of these, uh, these deserts. You notice that there are no deserts beyond a certain latitude, about 45 degrees north and 45 degrees south. And you also notice that some of these are also created because the rivers move uh, uh, as they, I mean, they, they have been pushed by the tectonic setting, and which creates a space for deserts to expand. Now, this is just a very simplistic uh, uh, snapshot of how uh, tectonic uh, settings or how continents by themselves determine the shape of deserts. So we can look at cratons means uh, older rocks or shields where uh, you know, uh, the, uh, geographic isolation was created because of an old landmass setting. For example, the Kalahari, the Australian desert, this necessarily does not mean that the deserts are themselves old, although the Saudi Arabian desert is older than most. Uh, let's look at those which are created in more recent times. That means after the closure of the Tethys Sea. Now, you would remember that I spoke to you about that the Sahara expanded only after the Tethys Sea began to close. Thar, on the other hand, is a much younger uh, uh, desert. It got created only more recently, and I'm going to come back to that a little later. Now, if you are in older uh, areas, like for example, areas behind uh, Tibet, for example, uh, the, the deserts of China, uh, they are typically examples of, uh, uh, of dry desiccating uh, deserts. I'm just going to skip this slide, but I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants to have a look at it. I'm now going to get into my journey because this is what uh, fascinates me more. I'm going to take a journey from the city of Jaipur, the glorious city of Jaipur, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. And I will traverse to the Lake of Sambhar, which is a, a very uh, beautiful part of uh, the country. Go to the historic town of Nag Nagor. Uh, then come to the majestic city of Jodhpur. Go to Jaisalmer, which is the golden city of uh, India, lovely forts. Then come to Barmer and end my journey there. Let me just brief you about uh, what is the Aravali. Aravalis are among the oldest whole mountains in the world, perhaps the oldest. There's, there's a bit of a controversy on which is older. The Australians say that what some of their mountains are older, but I think uh, by and large the jury is decided that the Aravalis are the oldest whole mountain in the world. And you can see these folds here, these wrinkles, these crumpled images showing how old these uh, mountains are, they've got eroded and they've gone washed down and weathered and do not, they're not very high in, uh, in now anymore. But what has happened is that over, over billions of years, they have been shifted and moved around because the landmass itself has moved and it has created a very interesting source of geography for, especially in the division of the hydrology of the, uh, Indo-Gangetic rivers and the Indus rivers. What do I mean by this? Uh, if you want to look at where does the where do the rocks that make uh, Aravalis originate, they actually start somewhere closer to Haridwar, which is uh, you know where you know the Ganga actually comes down to the valley. And from there, if you were to come draw the line and see where the, the where does the uh, Aravali uh, finish it actually ends near Baroda, in a town called Champaner. So it's that long, but it's broken because of several years of, uh, of erosion that it is now be, uh, only left behind a small pieces. So I'm going to be going, uh, I mean, this, this 
map I wanted to show you is because this is how it actually looks. Uh, you know, it's going to be broken, but it still has a significant influence, especially on the local geology and the way the water tables get distributed. And this is the rock that largely comprises the Aravi. This is called quartzite. It, in some places, can be rounded like this. It can be sharp and, and conical or pinselberg like but this is how it looks in and around Delhi until the time you reach just north of Jaipur. It looks like this. And if you were to break this, sometimes you get these wonderful patterns. Now, it's typical of in, in geology that, you know, geology is like a bit like chemistry. It's like, uh, you know, children playing with uh, solvents and reagents on a filter paper. So if you were to put some solvents in the center of the filter paper and then run it with a drop of alcohol and it spreads out, and this is the kind of beautiful patterns that you get. And this is what quartzite is. Quartzite basically means that sandstone, when it is heated on the surface or closer to the surface, it crystallizes, the silicon in it, the silica in it crystallizes to form these beautiful crystals. But separating out the iron, the magnesium, and the potassium, each of them carrying with itself like a filter paper. The filter paper here becomes the silica and the minerals within it are the ones that get dispersed in that medium. So you get these wonderful designs. And this is basically what, uh, when you heat sandstone under high pressure, under high heat, but very quickly release it on the surface, you get what's that. I'm going to take a journey first from Jaipur, go westwards, north, uh, west, northwest to Sambar. Please uh, pardon my amateur drawings. I mean, I couldn't do better than this, but what I'm going to do is, as I, as I leave Jaipur, this is the, Territory, which is, uh, like I said, is uh, predominantly quartzite, uh, and it's called the Aravali quartzite. But as soon as you leave uh, Jaipur, start going westwards, you come to a place where you find a, a glassy uh, rock which intrudes into, uh, which cuts into the quartzite and into the base rock, which is the basement rock called the granite. Now, the granite within the Aravali region is about 2.6. To 2.8 billion years old. That's what makes Aravali the oldest old mountain. And within them interspersed are some sandstone that remained unaltered because uh, of some reason. We, we don't know what the reasons are, but they remain unaffected by the heating that will happen from below that created the quartzite, but left behind some uh, sandstone <laughs> untouched. And it is around this sandstone that you find the Sambar Lake. Now, Sambar Lake is a fascinating salt lake that exists uh, at the margin of the desert, in the eastern margin of the desert. And let me show you what it looks like from space. Now, on the right, the scabby thing that you see is the gray thing on the, uh, of the image. That's the city of Jaipur. As you leave the city of Jaipur, you come to this blue, beautiful blue-looking uh, lake. Uh, it's fed by four uh, rivers, two large and two small streams. And the streams are the ones that bring in the water from the neighboring hills. And along with them, they get salt. This is how it looks uh, in, the, in the peak of summer. When the water is evaporated, you find a large amount of salt that has got con concentrated in the lake. And this is the one that, that is collected from panning. You notice also the pinkish color that you see on this, uh, uh, alongside the lake. That's a phytoplankton. That's the one that actually gives flamingos their color, the pink color. You know, the pink color in flamingos comes from eating this particular uh, plankton. There are channels that are made around uh, the Samba Lake, which are also uh, tapped and uh, which are also uh, gleaned for salt. You notice that there are uh, there is a, a yellow rock behind, which is very critical to the Thar Desert, and this is a phosphorus. Uh, uh, phosphate-rich rock, which is very, very important. And I'm going to tell you why it is important, because uh, uh, this is uh, something that uh, will come in the next slide. And um, So how did the Sambar Lake get made? Uh, it's a very recent creation. It's not millions or billions of years old. It's something that happened uh, around uh, 30 and uh, 14,000 years ago. Uh, Sambar Lake was a regular lake fed constantly by streams and rivers. But then there was this tectonic movement. If you look at the left image, there is there are these two arrows that are going up and down. You can see them going up like waffles, like, uh, you know, waffles in a, 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 a 
biscuits in a, in an ice cream uh, bowl and you can see that you know that movement that it's creating actually cause the rivers to move in uh, change their direction as well and the rivers instead of flowing into the sambal took a start a slightly longer tortuous route and eventually started to dry and became entirely sleepy and on the right uh, if you look at that image you notice that the uh, the lake has become completely sleepy and that's how the condition is even today the movement of the rocks the changing of the direction of the rivers and the movement also of the the wind system because if you notice there is one thing called wind gap on on images on uh, image b and image c that caused the the clouds to the rain bearing clouds to escape from that so there was no rain happening over the lake at this time so whatever rain fed uh, water was coming was from the deep inside deep interiors of the aravalis that trickled down and that's the reason why it became from being a soft water lake from a fresh water lake it became a solid lake if you want to just go about uh, 18 kilometers west from uh, the city of sambal you would come to this beautiful place called dhanapa it's a small village nobody cares about it but you know for people who love uh, paleontology this is a place to revere now it doesn't look like much right this is uh, looks like something like you know cement that was not utilized and had got uh, coagulated and become this but if you were to look at it very closely this is actually a very small microscopic uh, bacteria a photosynthetic bacteria which actually is formed layer upon layer now look very closely and you will start seeing the layers in gray this feature this colony of photosynthetic bacteria that you know what there was not a single bacteria but a colony of them several different species that came together to form this now they coagulated and formed a colony and uh, and formed a regular column like structure let me show it to you again this is how they look you know so they form these large column and rounded uh, structures which built layer upon layer utilizing this phosphate and producing all the oxygen between 3.2 billion years and 750,000 750 million years ago i beg your pardon so between 3 billion years and 750 million years earth was largely frozen and it was largely because of these features intermittently producing the oxygen that we breathe today before 3 million years ago there was very little free oxygen on earth it was the evolution of these small photosynthetic bacteria and their proliferation that caused the production of all the oxygen that is available for larger life to emerge today so this is one of those creatures that exists in rajasthan or in 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 the margins of the thar desert so typically these creatures would have grew, uh, would have uh, flourished in a place which was a shallow sea or an edge of a lagoon and they would grow in large mats covering the entire edge of that lagoon and producing oxygen day in and day out and there was so much oxygen produced that it would cause the earth to cool just as as, as you know that too much carbon dioxide causes global warming too much oxygen also causes freezing and this is exactly what was happening so between 3 billion years and 750 million years this organism was the one that orchestrated the earth to freeze several times over this is another example of a stromatolite the rock on the left it it's looking it looks mottled right it's from a phosphate mine where this this fossil is now crushed to make fertilizer and it is it's called this place is called jahmar putra it's near udaipur it's a beautiful place uh, but now ravaged by a phosphate mining company which is using it for making of course fertilizer and sometimes even food trays because it's food trays so this is another kind of stromatolite made by another set of different uh, photosynthetic organisms that came together to form these colonies and created all the oxygen that we breathe one thing that is typical of deserts is the, the types of soils that they have deserts have never been deserts all their life they are in current terms very recent inventions 
And if you were to look at this horizon, this beautiful picture, notice that there is a maroon layer below, which shows micros uh, microscopic organisms that formed a very rich organic layer. Just above that is the phosphate layer, again, where you find another layer of a different organism and some shelly creatures. So if you were to go up the horizon in a road cart or any such place where you find the cut hill, you would notice that the earth, or, or at least the land around the, the deserts, hold fascinating records of fossils and creatures and therefore the history of life. So what I find intriguing about this place is that in a single uh, uh, you know, glimpse, you can see an entire history. Of, this is about 300 million years of history that you can see in one single, uh, you know, one single view. I'm now going to leave the city of Nagore and move southeastwards to a place called Sendra, and I'm going to take you through this journey. I've left the quartzite country, I've entered the granite country, and I'm going to tell you how beautiful it looks like. So it, you have these beautiful highways, and I encourage people from Tamil Nadu to do road journeys to Rajasthan and Gujarat because they are beautiful country and you know you build a you can build a greater appreciation for the dry arid uh, parts of the country but also appreciate that uh, you know they have treasure troves of fossils and several uh, records from the time and each of these compressions and movements of earth caused the, the, the land to compress in this way and it looks like a leaf looks look like leaves of books and all you need to do is have a, a number of a local geologist handy and you know they would be able to tell you look for the for example I mean we were told in this case look for the dark brown uh, rocks here and you would find gastropods that in shelly mollusk cells shells from uh, you know from shallow seas and sure enough we did find them so you know that's what you need to know and this is from this brown layer that you see is from the late Jurassic there around 235 million years old. I'm just going to move, you see spectacular uh, rocks like these. The gray rock that you see is a, a granite rock and on top of it there's a thin veneer of a sedimentary and all because of the erosion both of them have got exposed. I'm going to, uh, I was talking to you about the granite country. Granite looks like this and I'm sure around Tamil Nadu, in su southwestern Tamil Nadu, especially around Nagar Coil you find beautiful and geospid granite, especially, and you could and you can have a look at this, at this as well. well. But this is a particularly interesting granite because it's very pink in color, and when you polish it, it looks very, very beautiful. And Rajasthan, in particular, has perhaps one of the finest granite uh, collections in the country. Look at this color, the color combination. You've got grays, you've got blues, you've got reds, you've got pinks, you've got yellows, and each one of them have, has an exotic name. So there's, uh, there's a Pali yellow, there's a Pali golden, there's a Nagaur rose, there is a Pali pink, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a Sendra red. So, you know, there are different names that have been given to these lovely rocks. And here's one spectacular rock. This is a granite uh, rock, which is called the owl head. It cannot be seen from the road. It's one of the better protected secrets uh, from uh, the lay public. As you notice, there's no graffiti or there's no... Uh, dhaba that has come close by and there's no, uh, you know, there's no litter. Uh, thankfully, this is protected and, you know, this, uh, it looks at different times of the day, you can see it looks absolutely majestic. It looks like an owl head and there's several other uh, such interesting rock formations in and around Sendra. I leave Sendra, I come to the city of uh, Jodhpur. Now, Jodhpur is, like I was telling you uh, uh, earlier, that 750 million years ago, the uh, the earth was still frozen and Jodhpur has a very interesting role to play in, in the defreezing of the earth and I'm going to show that to you in a second. But let me just tell you the road map between Jodhpur and towards the destination of the city of Jaisalmer. So from Jodhpur we will go to a place which is just next to Jodhpur about 10 or 12 kilometers southwest, about 6 kilometers actually as the crow flies. Uh, called the Sursagar Quarry, where we will be looking at a very, very old sandstone and one of the earliest creatures uh, to have uh, colonized the seas. And it's relatively easy for you to find a fossil of that, and I'll show you that. Then I'll show you the first sand dunes. And like I mentioned, sand dunes are, uh, it's not a necessary condition to have sand dunes to call anything a desert. The desert does not have to have a sand dune. 
and neither does a uh, sand dune make a desert nor does a desert make a uh, having a, a dune have make, make anything of this uh, then we are going to go to a very interesting place called the pokhran and the bab uh, boulder beds uh, pokhran as you know is the place where uh, the atomic bombs have been tested but it actually is a very interesting place because between 299 million years and 290 million years this was under a glacier uh, you know it was under glacier glacier uh, it was packed under a glacier and the rocks here actually have uh, very interesting uh, shapes and sizes and colors and then i'm going to come to a place called thayat which is which has a surprise for you this is the beautiful city of uh, of jodhpur uh, after you've uh, stopped admiring the majestic fort i want you to focus on the parallel lines that are kind of etched around the base of the hills and you would notice that they look a bit like staggered stairs if you were to go closer they look a little like this from top but if i were to show you a cutting edge again from the top this would this is how they would look like right they are a bit of hexagonal with a bit of a uh, a circular or semicircular ovoid shape in the center but if you were to look at it in a cross section they look like a column and this rock is called rhyolite it is a high grade uh, volcanic rock which is uh, you know extremely dense extremely hard to work on so although there there are two major types of volcanic rock one is the basalt and as you know that's made that's primarily in the uh, deccan province the deccan region of uh, central india created by the deccan volcanics this is an older much older rock uh, and this is much denser much harder because the cooling happens very very slowly a bit like granite you know the cooling happens slowly so the the, the minerals uh, get packed closely they bind closely and they just don't break so it's a very difficult rock to work with it's not easy to make and cut this into and make forts or do anything like that at least not with traditional technology but the same thing if you were to do with basalt you can create majestic uh, temples like the elora or the caves in bag or caves in in ajanta or or and, and fascinating temples all around maharashtra and i mean that you can do with basalt but you can't do that with rhyolite rhyolite is extremely hard and difficult to cut and this is what happens when you cut it you get these tall columns which are now being used to lay down foundations or boundary walls but other than that it's extremely expensive to cut it through and to you know use it for any other purpose so rhyolite is a difficult stone to work with but yet it is being pillaged and worked out uh, and gouged out of the earth now the reason why i want to labor on this a little more is to look at this particular map now if you were to look at the top end of the map on the left hand side there's a small yellow star that's where india was 750 million years ago and if you were to look at the red star at the you know closer to the center uh, I, i wish i could use a pointer but in case you are not able to spot it it's right in the center uh, it's got a red star that's greenland and greenland truly was green there was no ice in india including chennai perhaps was submerged under ice and this was one of the last phases of the frozen period of the earth remember i told you that between 3.2 billion years and uh, 750 million years the earth was practically frozen and it was only because of the volcanic uh, activity that happened in the jodhpur region the the ones that the rocks that i just showed you the rhyolites did the earth start to defreeze so we have jodhpur to thank for having gotten us out of that icy freeze and those rocks the rhyolites which we probably don't care much about are the ones that are that were found uh, that were formed by the volcanoes that uh, that actually created that uh, uh, massive heat to to melt all the ice that was that was around it now this is what it looks like the the rhyolite is on the bottom some some of it is column like the Yeah, yeah, no. Please continue. Please continue. It's fine. Okay, sorry. I got I I, I got muted. Okay, so uh, there's there's rhyolite on the bottom, and above that is sandstone that was formed because of the sea that the water that got melted and the 
soils and the sand got deposited on top of it. So this is typically the melting that was caused by the volcano. And then you have this amazing amount of layers of soils that get deposited over each other for millions and millions of years. And then you have sandstone on top. And if you look at this image, again, uh, once you stopped admiring the majestic code, look at it at the bottom again. The bottom right-hand side of the image, you see that uh, uh, the slightly darker red in, uh, rock, that's the rhyolite. On top of it is the orange and uh, yellowish orange rock, which is the sandstone that got after the freezing, after the defreezing of the rock, the soils that were carried by the, by, by the seas was deposited there. And this is what is of interest to us, because if you were to look at the sandstones, you find these large LP-shaped uh, disks in sandstone. For, a, for, for several years, uh, paleontologists could not understand what these were. And soon they realized that these were actually primitive algal plants. And here's another example. This is about six and a half feet long. And this is like a kelp, you know, a long algal plant attached to the bottom uh, of a shallow sea. And it is photosynthetic. It's got, you know, like a tree, it's got these dendrites, it's got branches, it's thick at the bottom, and it's got, uh, you know, a volume of uh, leaves coming up to the surface. Put to a place called Dechu, which is an, um, uh, the first signs where you see that, you know, the green cover has actually reduced significantly. And you see the first signs of sand dunes. Look at these hairpin. Uh, I, I'm more interested, I'm rushing my journey and coming to a place which I told you about the glacial beds. Now look at this. If you look at these rounded stones and uh, these uh, gouge, but the rocks on top is granite that has got shaped and reshaped under the weight of glacier. And you can see here again, this is a glacial field that was formed between 290, uh, 295 and 290 million years ago, right? And it's an entire gla glacial field that has been left behind and has stayed the way it is. There's been no sedimentary rock that came and deposited over it, so it stays exposed. And this is the beauty of it. Not all rocks will get covered. Some of them will stay exposed. And around this, on the top of a hill, you find some places where you have younger sandstone. This is a Jurassic, uh, uh, early Jurassic uh, sandstone. And you, if you notice, there are these squiggly things that you see. They look like cork schools, uh, especially on the left rock. Now, uh, this is iron with phosphate. And this is the ideal inoculum for the creation of new species and new creatures to take root. And that, therefore, you find the earlier marine organisms coming and taking root here. Again, a cross-section of uh, how it looks like, because, it, like I said, it was not always uh, a desert. This used to be a shallow marine or a lagoonal area. And you can see this from the exposure in the rocks itself. Now, if you look at the white uh, rocks at the bottom, it's very powdery. This is calcium rich. In fact, you find lots of shelly creatures in this. On top is the yellow phosphatic uh, material on top, which is rich, again, in shelly creatures. And on top is the iron-rich uh, washings that have come from the volcanic 750 million years ago, the volcanic uh, uh, iron that came out. But it got washed much later. In fact, more recently, it gets washed over and over again and comes from uh, distances far, far and away. So it's got nothing to do in temporal sense. The, the rock on top may be younger because it's been carried by both wind and uh, water to this place. I come to another place which is an abandoned phosphate mine. Uh, look out again on the bottom right, you will see a thin uh, uh, white layer, white and yellow striped layer. This is a stromatolite again. And on top of the stromatolite, you see a succession. These again look like nails that have been put together, rusted and put into plaster of Paris. This, these, are not, this, these are not nails. These are actually uh, something called what paleontologists like to call as ichnofossils. These are actually burrows of soft-bodied uh, creatures, perhaps worms or mollusks, snails and slugs that created these uh, tunnels while they were moving in soft mud. 
once the soft mud dried and became into rock, this is how it looks, perhaps about 200 million year old. And when you pick up rocks, you have to be careful because you look at creatures like this small scorpion. Scorpions were among the first creatures to invade the land, along with velvet worms and centipedes. So, you know, so this is a stark reminder and actually a sobering reminder to us that in the heat of the desert, you find creatures resting and you know, they, they only venture out in cooler times, late evenings and, um, and, and at night. So you have to be very careful when you uh, pick out fossils or, or stones uh, in the desert. Be very careful. I come to this uh, dhaba, a roadside eatery called, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a place called Thayat. This has actually become a junction now. And this dhaba about uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago did not exist. And it became very famous for geologists, paleontologists, and students of paleontology because of a discovery that was made here in 2012. I want to show you that discovery. It might not look much to you. This looks like a one rupee coin. Again, it does not look much. But try looking at the depressions on the right, and you would see a trident-shaped depression. Now, what this is, it's a footprint, and this uh, it's a footprint of a small chicken-sized dinosaur, uh, which is called Gralita. And uh, we had an entire slab going as far as 20 feet with uh, two uh, footprints going parallel to each other because this chicken-like creature would have walked for a distance. We presume this was a shallow beach and this creature, the gallator, would have come to uh, feast on anything that the sea or the lagoon would have brought in the morning. So. Here's an image, uh, a friend of mine at the Swedish uh, Natural History Museum decided to draw for me. And this is how the gralator would have looked like you know, around this shallow beach, trying to look for any creature that has that the sea nest may have left at the night, uh, or the previous night. And the footprints that you see are from those three-toed, uh, uh, you know, feet that this creature had. And from here, from Thayat, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, now unfortunately that uh, rock has got... Um, uh, you know, has got uh, pulverized and broken down because of expansion of roads. And, you know, there is no uh, uh, law in the country that actually uh, protects uh, fossils or fossil sites or even early anthropological sites. So a lot of our sites are actually getting, uh, you know, demolished or made into dump yards or expanded into or encroached upon. And there is very little protection. So this piece of slab of sandstone that we had is now possibly uh, lost forever. And all we have is some pictures. Um, as you approach the city of uh, Jaisalmer, this is the rock that you see. And the fort, entire fort is made from this yellow, golden yellow rock. That's why it's called the Golden City. But if you were to look at it closely, you see these twiggly marks, these black marks in the center. They look like Urdu or Arabic or Persian scriptures, you know, all gone all right. But actually, these are seashells. And there are millions and billions of seashells that are compressed together to actually make this single rock. And it's phosphate rich, but has a high amount of calcium. And this is called the Arbor limestone, right? Some people also call it the Arbor sandstone because it's got a lot of sand in it. But yeah, so because of the high calcium and phosphate, Lots of people prefer the purest, uh, especially the mineralogists, like to call it uh, 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 limestone. Uh, coming a little south of Jaisalmer is the place where you start seeing the three or four classical sand dunes that you actually tend to wrongly, although, uh, call a desert a desert. And you see these deserts uh, uh, dunes quite easily in, in the desert national park near Jaisalmer. Uh, the first, of course, is uh, the transversal dunes, which we saw uh, just uh, before we reached the city of Daintu. Remember the hairpin-shaped uh, dunes that we had seen? On the, on the east of it, you, there were some transversal dunes also. Barchans are very rare. It's not seen very often. These are usually seen in very large uh, uh, deserts, uh, and especially the Arabian deserts, the Mongolian deserts the Sahara, of course, but it's not very, very common to see at Barchan, but there have been some sightings, and here's a picture for me. Star dunes are rare. I think there are about uh, 10 or 15 star dune areas in India. Longitudinal dunes are quite common, especially around Badmer, Bikaner, and Jaisalmer, that area. You find these longitudinal long 
long range uh, beams that go like long strike with uh, something like this. This is a beautiful image of from Barmer and the uh, a, a dry paleo river. If you notice on the left, it's a dried river. There's some some greenery around it, but that's about it. There is there is these are the beautiful uh, longitudinal uh, uh, sand dunes that you have. And also notice if you at the center of the image, there's some other paleo channels that you can see that that appear. And this is what makes the desert extremely fascinating. This is going to be my final stop. I'm going to now go turn from Jaisalmer towards the city of Bardmer, and I come to a place where they are mining for multani mitti or fuller's earth. Uh, it's used for I don't know I, I know there's a word for it in Tamil, and I, I spoke to a friend. Uh, this morning, and he gave me a name, and I'm forgetting what it is called. I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed. I never picked up Tamil, and I'm, I'm deeply apologetic. But you know, this is Multani Mitti, and it's used uh, as uh, something to defoliate and exfoliate your skin, and also supposedly to make yourself fair. Uh, I don't want to get into this because it might not be politically correct for me to talk about it. <laughs> but uh, having said that, this is a uh, it's a wonderful place to look for fossils and. This is the gentleman who owns the mining lease, and you look at the number of sacks behind. They've got all the the rock, the the calcium and phosphorus-rich rock. It's a very soft rock you can mine from under the desert. And I've it's very easy to find fossils. I found this custard apple, uh, very and custard apple, as many of you know, was reintroduced into India by the Portuguese. It's not native to India. It got extinct. But now we have evidence that it used to exist at least 38 million years ago before the cases finally closed. We had forests which actually had the custard apple. So here's a fossil record, and you can get a uh, get a uh, fossil like this for yourself. And coconuts are quite easy. That's me holding it, uh, you know, about four or five years ago. A coconut fossil. Um, again, this is the enlargement of a coconut fossil. Notice the delicate hair that you can see along the coconut. Quite simple to get that, uh, get fossils of coconut in uh, Multani Mitti, Pulas uh, 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 mine. And finally, uh, there were some showers, some respite. Perhaps it was the time around this time of the year. Uh, and as soon as it rains, the creatures come out. And this is one of the rarest uh, of rare creatures that you see in the desert. It's a mushroom, it's a desert mushroom. Uh, and uh, I think I. I got an entire glimpse of something that was, you know, 750 million years old, and you know, created historic events, made life of complex creatures possible, and also looked at more humble creatures that created all the oxygen, and then this creature. So, you know, for me, my entire journey is all about looking at the spectacle of nature, and admiring nature from down downwards to upwards, and. I, I now resurface myself and look at something which has just come out of the ground, quite like me. And uh, I can see the light of the moon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Google. Thank you, Ashwin, for all your time and the opportunity. Uh, Pranay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, this wonderful talk. I, I should say that uh, uh, I had. Uh, no idea that you know we are going to so, uh, see so much of colors. Actually, uh, the idea of uh, desert is basically like uh, you know, uh, at least to me, in the very uh, with my limited knowledge, is like you know, uh, there's a lot of sand and nothing else. In fact, even the picture that we had for your uh, uh, talk it was just uh, uh, folding waves of uh, sand, and that's that's a typical. Um, you know, uh, graphic thinking, and, and then have a camel walk across. Uh, but the, the range and color of rocks that uh, you could see, the uh, bacterial and algal uh, sediments that you showed, it's it's a, it's a completely new world. Uh, so what uh, uh, you know, uh, what made you actually get into this? Uh, you know, before I can ask some questions uh, from the uh, viewers and from also from our side. Uh, what made you uh, look into uh, uh, these things? You know, wh what attracted you into uh, uh, this whole, um, uh, you know, uh, formation of rocks or, uh, you know, 
desserts or whatever it is you know uh, what attracted you into this i i think i distinctly remember uh, badri that you know about uh, when i was in class 7 i was i was uh, you know it was a geography class and i we were being taught uh, about rivers of uh, peninsula india you know godavari and kaveri and all the great rivers mm. and uh, you know all these rivers emanate out of close to mahabaleshwar and panchgini and you know those uh, mountains on the western ghats right and what i asked my teacher that you know we were told in physics that water would find a way closer to its closest you know take the descent to the closest uh, place to drain itself and so why does the river not go from panchgini to or from near pune to the arabian sea i mean that would be about 40 to 60 kilometers i mean why does it have to go 3000 kilometers or 2000 kilometers uh, eastwards into the bay of bengal and <clears throat> it was uh, you know that that provoked me and they they didn't have a sufficient answer and i think uh, that's the reason since then i've been collecting all my questions and trying to figure out you know the mysteries of why you know the desert exists in the northwest between uh, you know two great rivers and you know all those kind of things so i think uh, answers lie in the deep past and i think Uh, all history is actually biology and all biology is geology and all geology is actually basic physics and chemistry <laughs> so i guess you need to study all of that you know the building blocks of our knowledge need to start from deep down for deep down. Uh, for those who are uh, you know fans of big bang theory uh, web series <laughs> the view of uh, sheldon cooper on uh, geologists is something that you would uh, uh probably not agree with uh. i don't <laughs> i think you know i think it is uh, you know all sciences have their have their uh, you know periods i think there have been golden ages of physics and chemistry and uh, and biology and math i think geology is something that you know people started to understand only in the post world war 2 so it's a very new science and i think the convergence of different disciplines are, are the ones that are finding the mysteries of how earth works i mean that's how you're going to explain why uh, you know different landforms exist the way they do i mean there is some uh, science in that okay. that's what uh, needs to be respected i know i i remember that line it is i just <laughs> no no i i just wanted to uh, you know just uh, rail you a little bit um yes. uh, <laughs> sinivas and narayanan asks what is the depth of sand in sand dunes in a desert oh uh it is uh, well again uh, so they could be very very young deserts yeah. and uh, uh, you know they might have a couple of feet to meters i mean they don't have to be and like again deserts don't have to be like i said have to have sand dunes mm. some sand dunes like the ones in uh, saudi arabia and abu dhabi and other places go to several hundred meters because okay. they are old and they were basins so they were they were they were low and the sands kept coming in because of increased Uh, erosion of granite now sand we must remember is pulverized quartz quartz is basically a major source is granite which is getting eroded somewhere else mm-hmm. and it's coming and depositing itself there because this is the low point of the earth in terms of temperature in the sense that this is the the low pressure area and that's why everything congregates okay uh actually so, yeah like uh, just to just to read yeah. it it's about uh, can be several hundred meters okay So just a couple of feet to all the way up to uh, several hundred meters. Several hundred, several okay. hundred meters. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Akila Seshadri uh, wants to clarify that um, you know uh, that you said that the sandstorms that originate in desert are actually beneficial to other areas as they add nutrients. That's right. So she wanted to clarify that. That's what you right. actually so, meant. Yeah so uh, there are some very interesting recent research now again this is where you know weather scientists and geologists are criticized <laughs> i find that interesting because this this is a space that is growing now and the standing of an appreciation for deserts is only going to grow in the future because um so s- although the sandstorms that we see just now say in delhi if somebody has been to delhi in the summer god forbid but if you do you see this uh, wafting of dust that comes from the western part of india or western part of the subcontinent um and this is quite like the route that uh, the locusts are taking just now it's quite like that i mean remember the locusts are also nutrients right i mean that i'm just going to park that aside but you know 
if you were to look at the rotation of the Earth in the northern hemisphere, uh, the Red Sea area and both sides of the Red Sea have a massive desert. And as low pressure gets created in India, and before the monsoons can actually advance, you find a lot, lot of dust coming from uh, the land part from Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, from over the sea as well. So there is this brown layer that you can see if you were to now travel, I mean, if you were able to travel now, you would see this even as you descend into, uh, you know, Dubai or Doha or wherever, or even into uh, Egypt. So there is this constant brown, uh, dusty layer that is coming into uh, the subcontinent. And this is a critical thing for us because it fertilizes uh, our, uh, our forests. Now, let us remember that because of the high precipitation in, say, Kerala or, or in, in Karnataka, you have a huge amount of nutrient leaching that takes place every, uh, every, every monsoon. There has to be replenishment of new amount of nutrients that is needed. Uh, and this is where the dust from the Red Sea uh, area of the, or the Afar region or, or the Sahara or the Saudi Arabian desert is very, very critical. Uh, fantastic studies being done uh, by leading universities in America on the role of Sahara's fertilization on Amazon. And I would urge you to have a look at it. Okay. Some very, very interesting pages developed by Nat Geo and uh, uh, NASA and uh, several other agencies. I would urge you to look at it. Uh, it's a, a little um, non-scientific more uh, uh, question on economy and the way we are uh, consuming uh, material. Uh, you know, you said that even those difficult rocks people are cutting out and taking it out. Then you also showed multani miti being mined. Now, if uh, the typical environmental point is that uh, reckless mining of all these material will have huge, uh, uh, you know, ecological damages, right? Uh, but let me ask a slightly different question. There's, there is a lot of rocky formation in, uh, in the desert. There's a lot of sand in the desert. Uh, they are uh, needed for construction elsewhere. Uh, and you have, uh, you know, as you say, hundreds of meters depth in many places. So, is it really wrong to start making use of this material for uh, uh, the rest of the country's uh, construction related activities or uh, what would happen if uh, we keep, uh, uh, I don't want to use the word plundering, but let's say we want to we make use of this material, what happens to the ecosystem right there in the desert and around uh, uh, in the nearby regions? Right. So, I think um, as you start mining, I mean, if you were to start, say, taking soils from uh, from the Thar region, uh, the Thar uh, sandstorm actually go to western Nepal and central Nepal and go further on. So I think we have to, you know, take a global view. I mean, even the Australian desert. Let's talk about sand. I think sand is a very critical area, especially see back-to-back -back, uh, floods in Kerala. Mm -hmm. If you notice, Kerala has been for the last decade has been importing sand from, you know, Southeast Asia for their construction. Mm -hmm. They mine their rivers because they have a rich uh, soil which is which is called monazon, right? Which is now surreptitiously and illicitly sold to the Chinese for uh, nuclear power, mm. right? So the sand that is there in Kerala is not used for local construction. It is rather shipped out, and then the the same ships or the, another set of ships will get you sand for construction. So that's the logic, right? Mm. Now. Uh, would it be, I mean, there are two things that you have to look at. One is the ecological service. Now, in Kerala, I think the ecological services are broken. And uh, while we are very appreciative of several things that Kerala has got right, but clearly on environment, Kerala has not got its uh, act together. Okay? Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm digressing from answering your question, but I'm trying to illustrate it with, should sand come from, say, J Jaisalmer or Barmer? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think, uh, you know, construction has to be of cement and of the, uh, you know, Portland cement style in every locality. You know, before the 1950s, we did not use cement for making our homes. We used laterite rock to make a traditional Kerala home. 
right? Mm. Why are we not doing them? They are stable, they are better, they are local. They don't disrupt uh, your river systems and everything else. Right? Today, there's very little in the rivers to absorb the shocks that come from the monsoon. Yes. Right? So those are the kind of concerns that are emanating because we disturb ecology and not understanding the larger frame of things in terms of time and in terms of interconnectedness between ecosystems. And there is, can be uh, Badi and Goku, no value that you can give to saving lives or saving destruction of property once an event occurs. Right? No, uh, uh, think I, about it, had we not had illicit trade or wildlife, we would be working this way. We would be in a very different mode. You know, we would have not been talking about the pandemic. It's all the interconnectedness of one small thing disturbing the ecosystem of that animal and the lung environment in that of that virus, and it has reached us and you know caused the chaos that we need. And it's exactly the same with nature. So I don't think it is prudent to say that connecting rivers or extracting from one place. Even through economic and ecological estimates, I think it's a very, very temporary thing. We have to be judicious. I think we've been in the right. The word is right and apt. I would say in lots of places, the economics is right. Okay. Um, on a different note, uh, Maha Somasundara wants to know why there are sand dunes in a desert. Uh, and why there is the presence of sand in few deserts and not every desert. That's right. So desert does not, like I said, does not have a, a classical definition. It is defined on the availability of water and the aridity, right? So, uh, so there are cold deserts like Ladakh mm -hmm. uh, or Taklamakan Desert. You know, those are cold deserts. They are frozen, but there's no water in free water for plants to grow or for primary producers to support secondary producers. So that's the reason why hyper-arid and arid and semi-arid regions exist. And the classic problem is that we have only called, uh, you know, the dune deserts as the ones as deserts and the rest of them are arable and can are cultivable. I think that's a big mistake. Mm. So we have, in a sense, about 11 to 13 percent of arid desert and about 6 to 7 percent of land which has degraded from becoming grassland into semi-arid. Classic case of that is Tirunal Valley. If you were to go to the the page on of the groundwater board, for example, Tirunal Valley is actually uh, semi-arid to a hyper-arid. You know? oh. So, and it has strong repercussions for history. And I'm not going to go into this because this is another pet area of mine. I talk about the rising fall of civilizations and how climate mm. has actually Okay. Uh, Siddharth Venkateshan asks, given the fact that all the natural events like sandstorms have global significance, what part should geologists play in policy making around large projects? Right. I think it's not just sandstorm. This is a great question. Thank you for asking. I think geologists in India are possibly the most disenfranchised science. Uh, I mean, you, you can't name me one. You can name me a hundred medical doctors, but you will not be able to name me one geologist. I mean, I mean, I'm talking about a lay person, right? Uh, that's because we have not accorded geology uh, or geologists the same importance that we need to. Because at the end of the day, we need to look at tectonics, we need to look at seismology, we need to look at ground hydro hydrology. All of those have very, very serious impact on the way the forests are going to look like or how water supply is going to get affected in cities. I think Bombay, uh, Chennai, uh, even North, not, not parts of Kerala, which have huge uh, water shortages. Think about it. You have floods, you have no water. Mm -hmm. Now, geologists have not been asked whether things can be cut, a rock, a rock face can be cut because, uh, you know, just because it is there is ease of cutting through it. Uh, and you remember the image that I showed you of linear moments. Mm -hmm. Nobody paid uh, enough importance to those linear moments or those structures, those geological structures for which we need to be paying attention. And I think a lot of the seismic events that, that happen, uh, and I think apart from Japan, New Zealand, and a few other countries where, of course, seismology plays, plays a very significant and central role. In India, I don't think we've paid enough attention to science or scientists in policy making per se, and geologists, even less so. 
So it's not just sandstorms. I think even monsoons. I think so many other things that we need to talk about, in which uh, rivers. I mean, the absence of ponds. I think it's one of my very dear things that I like to talk about is the absence of ponds. Uh, you know, the over reliance on large irrigation systems. It's a very British concept. You know, you know, creating a Buckingham Canal and then mm -hmm. doing what? Right. So that's the problem that we don't have a, a you know. Uh, understanding of how irrigation is going to play and react with soils. Think about it. You created the Faraka Baraj. You now have an arsenic problem in problem in Bengal and in Bangladesh and now in Bihar, right? You create uh, dams all around uh, the Jordan River, river, and, and 25 years later or 30 years later, you have the Syrian war. It's it's about water shock. It's not about looking at the holistic thing. Of how water needs to percolate and irrigate the entire valley, and the traditional systems of agriculture, all of that is destroyed. I think that's happened in India. It's happened in Pakistan. Entire South South Asia is there for a flashpoint just now because of water and the way we've managed it. It's got nothing to do about usurping land. No, I I, I take your point. I mean. Uh, governments are uh, sometimes, you know, not sometimes, most of the times, you know, not thinking for the long term and, uh, you know, uh, suddenly we think that uh, water and cultivation is the most important thing, we build big dams, uh, we, you know, we think we need uh, more food and uh, productivity is low, we just, you know, convert as much of the land as uh, arable land and then uh, produce a lot of, uh, you know, uh, crops which require huge amounts of water and then there are bore wells and you can just keep linking one to the other. But how do we come up with a policy for the next century? You know, we, we are not talking about, I mean, we have already, uh, we, are, we know where we are, but we know we have done a lot of mistakes. But what do we do uh, where we come up with an integrated policy for the next uh, 100 years? Uh, I, I'm not saying, you know, you give us an answer right now. But uh, it, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's very difficult to really think about how to go about doing these things correct. I think, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think, look, I mean, first thing we have to do is be participatory and get geologists and, you know, disciplines which are critical mm -hmm. to whom we take for granted. You know, if, I mean, let's look at this current uh, pandemic crisis. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many virologists are there on board? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were to analyze this, there are no virologists. I think I'll rest my case because you can't address this uh, on board. Okay. Uh, there's one one uh, last question. Um, we have just one second. Uh, just went off. Uh, Narayanan. Uh, one second. One second. Okay. He has uh, removed the question, but it was basically like. Uh, um, well, I'll, I'll skip that question. Uh, Akila Seshadri wants to know, school history texts have often postulated that the Indus civilization ended with increasing desertification. Now, how far is this possible? Uh, Akila, I am going to talk to you about this a little later, perhaps in two years time, because there is very good evidence that's coming out. It's not just desertification, uh, because if you were to look at the timing of all the civilizations and also you know, I, I don't like just Indus civilization. I think there were civilizations in East India and, of course, there were two civilizations in South India. And I think we need to look at those as well. And, uh, you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, I'm, just the short answer of it, I mean, I'm just going to say this, that, you know, between 3 million years and as recently as 16,000 year, 16, years ago, uh, you know, the deserts, especially something like the Sahara, was actually a tropical paradise, you know. So what we now know from paleoclimate and archaeological evidence is that, you know, much of, uh, you know, somewhere between 11,000 and 5,000 years ago, the Earth's orbital wobble, I mean, you, know, I, you know, as you know, Earth is like a top and it's wobbling around the sun. Now, this is called wobbling, right? And sometimes the wobble is greater, and sometimes it is more steady. Imagine it to be like a top. Now, that wobble had... Uh, you know, kind of transformed a little. And, you know, between 11,000 and 5,000 years ago, the Sahara had completely spread, the Thar Desert had encroached, and, you know, the rivers in India uh, 
had kind of also moved away. I mean, Indus, for example, moved westward, as I mentioned earlier. So the, there was a transformation in the local environment and the global climate as well. This period is particularly important, and it's called the African Humid Period. And I would urge you to research this, because this is an area of immense global uh, research. Not, not all continents you know, coincide, not all civilizations coincide at the same time in their fall. Sumerians and the, uh, you know, I'm sorry, the Mesopotamia, Mesopotamians and the late Chinese and the Indus, uh, you know, the rise and fall of these uh, civilizations were at different times. And the cause of the falls was slightly different also. Uh, there's also about the emergence of uh, certain fevers, uh, especially smallpox and measles that could have caused this. But, you know, there's some very interesting work that is happening in Rakhiwari, the bones that are coming out of Rakhiwari. And the, 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 there's going to be very interesting uh, research that's going to come out in the next two or three years. And, you know, I think we are going to have better resolution to understand what happened during the African humid periods and the expansion of the deserts and the shrinking of the rivers. I think, mind, watch the space is what I would say. Okay. Uh, just a related question from Muttu Kesavan. How do the academic geologists view the recent paper on, on the existence of a perennial river in the Harappan heartland and its conclusions? I don't know what paper he refers to. Maybe you. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. I think yeah, I'm reading. I, I'm reading this very carefully, and I'm treading this very carefully because current, uh, you know, there, there's a political bias as well on this, and I think the geological evidence uh, has to be weighed in very carefully. There has to be uh, stratigraphic and geochronology. I mean, both timing as well as looking at the sequence of layers. All those have to be combined, and it is not going to be an easy answer. We know that the river systems did change. The rivers did disappear. And it happened because of tectonics, not flooding of desert. Desert was a consequence, not the main mm. reason driving mm. Remember that, you know, there was a very famous earthquake called the Allah Bani uh, earthquake in 1819. And I urge other people to have a look at it, in which certain parts of Kutch rose by 8 meters. Right? And, you know, okay. think about it. it it's a massive wow. amount of... You know, eight meters in Kutch, which is entirely a flat moon, you just suddenly get eight meters high hillux. And that's what Allah Ban did. And this is the kind of earthquake, this happened at the time when we could measure it. There have been several times earlier when the measurements were not possible and the impact of the Earth's movement and the earthquakes are far, far deeper, far wider to have transformed the course of the Indus rivers and the other rivers up now. So I think I'm going to be circumspect. I want to see the letters to the editor. This paper by itself is not conclusive. I'll wait for more answers. Okay. Uh, there are more questions, but we have run out of time. Uh, it's fascinating, uh, Pranay. Send them to me. I'd love to answer them individually. Yeah, I will, I will collect uh, more questions and then uh, send them to you. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, it has opened our eyes to, uh, uh, you know, the, how we need to look at... Uh, you know, many of the natural formations, uh, you know, urging uh, young, uh, uh, you know, viewers of this program and particularly students to go and start looking at, you know, many of the things that you've talked about, none of which we get in our school textbooks, anywhere, even in the last page, even in the last couple of pages, sadly. Uh, so, uh, this has uh, given us uh, a wonderful uh, picture. So this video uh, with enhanced audio will be there. Uh, so I have a local copy of the audio which I will uh, uh, add on top of this uh, video. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Pranay. Uh, Gopu, you want to add anything? No, oh, thank you. I just thought that the uh, Jodhpur volcano story and the transformation that's uh, historically very fascinating. I think that should uh, that should really be in our textbooks. So that should be. Wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you, Ashwin. Thank you, Pranay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. We'll come back to you with uh, another program next month. Thank you. Bye-bye.